welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, here today. And we're continuing in our study of uh, Colossians, and we're getting close to the end. We are. Yeah, we are going to cross over into the last chapter. Uh, we will be looking at the last uh, little sermon on Colossians in two weeks' time. And next week, uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, some things to do with Father's Day. So if you are keener, uh, which I know some of you are, or if your small group is following along with the passage, passages that we're looking at, then next week uh, we will be preaching on, and small groups will be looking at John 15 uh, in the first 11-ish verses. So you can uh, put that on your uh, calendar or write it in your diary, if you were Charlie, that's what you would say. Um, but yeah, we'll take a look at that next week. But this week, we are looking at Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 16, and then crossing into the first verse of chapter 4, which I know is weird, but we're going to do it anyways because it makes sense. It does. Yeah. So take take a moment, have a read, uh, Colossians 3, verse 16, to, to the first verse of, of chapter 4. And this is a question that we would like you to have in mind as you read it and maybe even take a couple moments afterwards uh, and discuss it uh, with whoever you're watching with. But how does this passage fit in with the rest of the book of Colossians? So in light of all that we've been talking about over the last several weeks, what you've been talking about in your small groups, what you've been learning, uh, what God's been teaching you, how does, how does this passage fit in? Uh, so come, come back with, with that answer uh, in mind, and then we'll also chat about that a bit. So hit pause, take a read, and then come back and join us. All right, you're back, and we are here still. Uh, we would love to hear your answers. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite work out over this type of format, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe there's a, a, a big variety of answers. I'm, I'm sure there would be to that question. But as, as Charlie and I were talking about this passage and, and thinking about, uh, about it, it, it can be easy when you're, when you're preaching or teaching or, or going through a series like this to kind of view each, each chunk as kind of a standalone. But it's so helpful to see it in, in the context of, of the, whole, the whole letter. And really this, this passage that we're looking at, these, these few verses, really bring to life the reality that Paul is aiming for. And it's that the Colossians would remain rooted in Christ. And that's a phrase that is used in, in this book. Uh, he talks also about them not wanting them to be taken captive, to be dragged away, uh, to lose connection with the head um, being Jesus. And he even identifies throughout this book uh, some, some dangers uh, to do with Judaism, to do with uh, mysticism to do with legalism to do with uh, harsh treatment of our of our bodies uh, that can actually drag us away uh, from the life that is found in Jesus and and he makes makes much of, of Jesus and his uh, supremacy over all things and all throughout the the book this this reality of being in Christ and having our life in Christ has been really been pointed towards and then we get to this passage uh, that we're taking a look at, and it's just insanely practical, intensely practical, as to what being in Christ is going to look like in the relationships that we have with people. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, as, as we were chatting around that, that's kind of what, what emerged for us. And, and specifically, Charlie, there was one verse that kind of stood out uh, above the rest as kind of the theme verse or the, the verse that kind of rises to the top in this passage. Why don't you share a little bit about that? Okay, I will. And a little bit before it. But yeah, we were having conversation. There's so much in this passage and, and looking at it and thinking, so what what is Paul saying? Why is he saying it? And, and as we answered that question, this is the verse I think for both of us leapt out. Um, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father. But that first part, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And, and so there is this continuation from the passages before and what we've been talking about in previous weeks of it's all about us in Christ. 
And now it's us in Christ in whatever else we're doing, whatever our life takes us into. Um, do it in Christ. Do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. So um, right at the beginning of the passage, I, I, I am going to say something about the Lord Jesus, but I'm going to start with the first verse. Let the word of Christ richly del dwell within you. Del dwell. Um, I was chatting with someone earlier this week, and we were talking about why is it that Jesus and Christ seem to be interchangeable. Is there a difference? What is the difference? When, how, where are these words? I mean, Jesus is the name, obviously, of Jesus, but Christ is a title. It means the Messiah, the Anointed One. And really where we came to in that conversation is that um, the prophecies from the Old Testament clearly indicated that when Jesus in prior his birth you know, Jesus was destined to be the Christ, the anointed one, who would be the deliverer of his people. But if he had veered off, um, he wouldn't have become the Christ. Um, and that sort of opens up a whole different set of thoughts. But, but he became the Christ. He was destined to become the Christ. He was prophesied to become the Christ. But the Christ is the king, yeah. the anointed one, um, the ultimate eternal king, the one to be obeyed because he is the king with all authority. And that is who we're relating to throughout the book, but who we're relating to here. It's not just Jesus who says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, but my friends. This is King Jesus. And the implication of all of that is, is this immediacy of obedience right. um, and that's what comes through in my understanding of doing all in the name of the Lord Jesus it's not just just to do, do all in the name of Jesus but in the Lord Jesus the one who is the Christ the King the one who is to be obeyed the one to pay all attention to never forgetting who we are accountable to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus and what does it mean to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus? It's not enough to just say, oh yeah, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus, whatever it might be. But it's doing it in a manner that is representative of Jesus. Doing it in a manner that the way I thought about it would be that Jesus would then be able to say, yeah, that's exactly how I would have done it. Yes. That's exactly what I would have said. Yep, I'll sign off on that. Yeah. It's that sort of representation. It's not just a blank check that we can take a stamp and put his name on it, but it's a way of living where he would utterly approve, where he is not just represented, but illustrated and lived out that yeah. we really are the living embodiment, the living letter of Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and that makes sense as well. A again, a verse right at the beginning that, that I picked up on with, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We're talking earlier and I was saying, I don't know whether I'll include it. I am including it. But it's this sense that as we are in Christ and as Christ is in us, as we're as he is dwelling, his word is richly dwelling in us and that we're living out his word in relationship, that it's in that setting that we teach and admonish one another. We don't just rely on the gifted teachers. For example, those mentioned in Ephesians chapter four, we're not looking at that passage, but, but we all have this teacher, the yeah. Christ, living within us, right. that we might admonish and teach one another in the group settings or whatever group settings we might be in, but also in the sort of relationships yeah. that Paul now picks up on, yeah. um, really as kind of illustration of where we would live out mm -hmm. the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that really, we would live in these relationships in such a way that we would be speaking to one another, whether it's 
husband to wife, child to parent, worker to employer, saying, well, I don't think that's how Jesus would have spoken to me. And to be honest, I can think of occasion where my wife would have had absolutely justifiable and valid occasion to say, you know, Charlie, I don't think Jesus would have spoken to me like that. And that's the bottom line of, of admonishing and teaching one another that we can measure, not in a judgmental way, but in this helpful way yeah. of trying to lift us up that we would be truly representative of Christ in, yeah. in all these relationships. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that we would do all, yeah. whether it's in word or deed, yeah. in the name of the Lord Jesus. That yeah. seems to us to be the key verse yeah. in this little passage. Yeah, and, and you kind of already jumped into it a little bit, but the, the two main areas that... Paul then gets into our family yeah. life and, and work life. And we we're, were taking note of that, and we're not going to say much about this, but it's interesting that he talks about family life and work life. He doesn't talk about, and then your your hobbies or your play life or your 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 other interests. It's yeah. just family and work, and 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 we're not going to talk tons about that, but it but it is something I think for us to chew on, and just our culture gives. A lot of emphasis on on this third area of our life about our own personal interests our own um, things that we like to do um, outside of those two areas family and work uh, but the the main place that this is gonna focus on is is places that we carry responsibility yeah. it's not about places where, where we're free to do whatever we want but it's about it's about areas where we carry responsibility and that responsibility is is towards towards God first most, but yeah. then towards the, the people around us. And and I think I like what I like about this passage is these are two areas that for me can feel at times uh, quite mundane. Family life and work life can can feel, and, and from talking to other people, it's it's a source of, of feeling like life is just kind of mundane in 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 the the day-to-day of, of family stuff and the day-to-day -day of work stuff. And yet it's like Christ breathes in this, this hopeful expectation that in all these areas, in all these relationships, in all these responsibilities, there's, there's an invitation to do them with him and to do them for him. Yeah. And that's, that's incredibly encouraging. And we're not, gonna, we're not gonna dive necessarily deeply into each of these areas but we'll touch on them a little bit uh, but we encourage you to to hear from the Lord there there most likely will be one of these type of relationships that really stands out to you and that God wants to admonish you in uh, and and teach you in, and and challenge you in, and and let him do that uh, as as you listen and as you watch um, and and the, just before we get into it there there's not a lot said about each of these relationships it's a small little line and i think that's really intentional it's incredibly simple and and in many ways bare bones incredibly profound but very very simple and i think that is intentional because when when Brittany and i as we're learning to raise our kids we, we try to make the things that we ask them to do as simple as possible because if they're too complex it's it's easy for them to lose yeah. the instruction yeah. but in the simplicity of it we we can we can see um them learn to obey and we can see if, if they have a heart to obey and to follow and i think jesus does that here as well with us it's just very simple and then and then he watches do we have a heart to obey and to respond yeah. and so um yeah so keep, keep that in mind also as we get into this so I'm just going to pick up uh, on the marriage relationship here. So it talks about uh, um, wives and how they should su submit to their husbands. Um, and it says that this is something that, that's fitting. It, it's proper and, and in, in Jesus and in, in his relationship um, with, with us. And we could get into that in a lot of different ways and, and how Paul picks up on that in Ephesians. Um, and and says how that's a picture of the relationship of, of the church and Christ 
Um, but for me, what was highlighted, maybe because I'm a husband, um, but what was highlighted in this marriage relationship is what he says about um, husbands. And he says that husbands um, should, let me read it here so I don't misquote it, um, but husbands should uh, love their wives. Um, lost my spot. There you go. And do not be harsh with them. That's what my translation says. But as I looked into that word, it, it um, do not be harsh with them is to not become bitter or irritated um, or, or exasperated. And, and yeah, as I was reflecting on that, I just realized that, that at times I can become bitter towards, towards Brittany. And, and specifically what that happens around is typically when I feel like she, she has not understood me, where I've been coming from. And so I begin to become bitter because she's not understanding me. She's not, she's not getting my intention. Um, uh, you've misunderstood me is something I often bring up out of an irritation. No, this, you've misunderstood me. That's not what I meant. And this bitterness can start wrapping itself around my heart. And I don't know if you guys know this, but it's very hard to love someone that you're bitter towards. I would say it's actually impossible. Uh, and I've, I've realized this, uh, this is huge for me outside of marriage as well. People that I feel bitter towards, that I feel have disappointed me, have not um, done or misunderstood me, misquoted me, things like that. If I become bitter towards them, it's extremely difficult. It's impossible to, to love them. And so that's, that's one thing that stood out that as, as a husband, as God calls me to love my wife, then, then the response of that is is not to allow any bitterness in in my relationship with with Brittany uh, to to come up because or to be left undealt with because that bitterness left undealt with will automatically lead to a lack of love. Um, so there might be other things uh, that you want to add to the marriage one, or or we can just move on to kids and parents. I think what you said is spot on. I mean, one thing I think for all of these relationships, all, all that Paul talks about, as we were talking earlier, it, it, it's a sense that he says very little. And in other places, he says quite a bit more. So, so there's a sense that he's choosing to say very little. Yeah. And as, as we were talking earlier, I think we think that it's because of the context is... All of these things are, you know, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. You know, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, but this is well pleasing to the Lord. All of these things mm -hmm. are to be in Christ. And that is the prime relationship. And that's what Paul has talked about right. in the previous chapters, where there's so much about how we share in the death the crucifixion, we've been crucified with Christ, we've been raised with him. And he explains, Paul explains so much more about the implications and the richness of being in Christ. And, yeah. and I would say if there are any aspects of, of, even in the tiny bits that Paul writes that we think, what does that mean? Or how do you do that? It, if we've got any sort of um, questions, objections, challenges, it's about going back to Christ and saying, somehow I must be missing what you have done for me and how I should be living for you. Right. Please, will you help me so that I can live it out in this yeah. relationship? So, yeah. so there's that side in, in just generally. I know for myself, when it, when it talked about love your wives, don't be embittered against them. I, I struggled with that word embittered. I thought, have I ever been embittered? I would say I've been frustrated. I've been frustrated to, and if Judy was sitting where you are, I would be saying exactly the same and Judy would be looking at me smiling because she knows how frustrated I've got. And it's more a reflection of me, right. not of her. How frustrated does Jesus get with me? He doesn't at all. And it's not a reflection of me and how I could never frustrate anyone. It's, <laughs> it's because of him and his grace. So here I think I get frustrated. And then I thought, well, how do I feel in that frustration? And I thought, it, I, I, I shy away from using the word embittered, but, but I think that's where it leads to. Yeah. And it makes me want to go back to Jesus and say, help me here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we 
you haven't commented on wives, I'm not going to either. But but for each one, you know, for each of these relationships, how it's fit, you know, listen to the Lord, listen to what Paul is saying, and go with it. Family, children, and fathers. Again, for me, um, the bit that's well, let's. The children, it says, you know, children be obedient to your parents in all things. And I think most parents at some point of being a parent thinks, kids get this. Mm -hmm. if, if only my kids would get this, then my life would be a dream. And But it's interesting, Paul is writing to children. He's not writing to parents saying, hey, parents, tell your children they should obey you. He's writing to children saying, be obedient to your parents. So clearly he's writing to children of an age who can read and who can understand, who and, and who exercise choice in this, and who are of, a, of an age old enough to read and understand, but young enough that they're not independent of their parents. So it's a challenge, and I remember as a teenager that that would be a challenge to me. Um, but what I remember most about being a teenager and this is probably because I look back with rose-colored spectacles at myself and just think, what? Well, actually, I don't these days. I look back and think, what an awful child I must have been for my parents. But it's this, fathers do not exasperate your children. And I can remember, bless my father, he's still alive, he's 99. And um, I just think of so much I've received from him, and yet there were times where I felt so very, very exasperated. And, and I think where that exasperation leads to is an attitude that says, I can't wait to be out of here. And might even say, I'm running away from home and might even threaten that and do all of that. Um, but, but it's that attitude of, I can't wait until I'm out of here, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think many children can relate to that but yeah but fathers the effect you know i'm speaking to myself that it children lose heart what does that mean heart if we go to proverbs it's tied in with government and somewhere that sort of exasperation of expecting an obedience in areas that really are inappropriate or well beyond right. what is reasonable um it leads to a, a robbing, a breaking of government in the children as we expect um, too much or, in a, or expect things in a manner that is well beyond what is reasonable. And, and it, can, it gives lasting wounds. Again, if these things are speaking to you in either, in any way, it's about going back I mean, it's about making adjustments, but it's about going back to Christ yeah. somewhere and saying, I'm not getting all that I should be understanding right. in my relationship with you and what you have done for me. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and then the, the final relationship that he picks up on is, and I think spends the most time yeah. on, is is our, our working relationships between uh, those who are... Uh, uh, let's just call them common people or working people, yeah. um, and those who are our employers or foremans or managers, and and here it, the the wording is slaves and masters, which I mean we don't talk like that anymore. But the type of uh, bond servants or slaves or whatever, uh, it was it was more like a contract work. Um, yeah. It was it was more like you you will fulfill this for this period of time. And then after that, you'll you'll be free to go, kind of thing. Once you've served your your time here with me um, as a bond servant, and and that's I mean we that's how a lot of our I think working relationships yeah. work. Whether it's work building a house for someone yeah. uh, or or teaching, uh, you you commit to a certain amount of time or a certain amount of work, and and you're responsible to to fulfill that. And your your manager or your employer or whoever it is, a supervisor, um, yeah, a supervisor, foreman, exactly. A, you know, any level of responsibility. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, any study of slavery in first century Middle East you would understand that it's describing a wide range totally. of, of you know, working relationship. It's not the sort of slavery we typically yeah. would think of. Yeah, totally. 
Um, and so there's both of both aspects, just like husband and, and wife are both talked about and, and child and, and father are both talked about in, in here as well. Uh, Paul wants to write to, God wants to write to uh, both those who, who work um, and those who work, but with responsibility over people working beneath them um, or working for them. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've found like in my current job, if you want to call it, it's quite, uh, it's quite easy to feel like my, my master is, is Jesus. That, that if people say, oh, you work for the church, I, sure. But I really would like, I work, I believe like my yeah. personal conviction is I work for God. Yeah. Um, but real, realistically, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a construction worker, or whether you drive a garbage truck or, or what, whatever you do, um, this passage is imploring us that you have a master who is Jesus, yeah. the Christ, and, yeah. and you are supposed to work and serve uh, and, and do your work with, with heart, with passion, with, with, with conviction, as if you were doing it for Jesus. Uh, and these are verses that we often see plastered on, on walls and stuff like that, and we go, that, that's encouraging. But it's actually really challenging. It's there, very, uh, yeah. There's a reality to this where it's like, wow, do do I work as if I'm working for Jesus? Um, do I go home at the end of the day uh, with with a satisfaction, a peace, knowing that that I I worked in a way that that Jesus would be pleased with, um, that I served in a way that I didn't. Uh, my work didn't ebb, on, ebb and flow according to how much praise I was getting or, or response from other people or whether people were watching, but it was, it was consistent. And there's all sorts of, imp I think Jesus walking with a particular purpose in mind yeah. could and would get distracted yeah. by someone asking for help. Right. And I think, how does that mm -hmm. fit into a working relationship? Be, you sure. know, really, can I? And to, there's all manner of implications yeah. of what it means to to understand that I'm working for Jesus, representing Him, where He would say, "Yup, I'll sign off on that. I like the way you ignored that distraction." But equally, where He'd say, "But why didn't you stop mm -hmm. and deal with that?" Do you, don't you think I would have done? Yeah. The, the, the huge implications. Totally. Totally. Mind boggling. Yeah, and I think for each of us in in one sense it looks the same and in other senses it's it's incredibly yeah. different. Um and I like it, that word it, where it says um that we shouldn't that we shouldn't work as uh as people in the way of eye service or as people pleasers but with sincerity of heart and that, that word sincerity, it's a small word, but as I looked at it, um, there was a few different ways it can be understood. It, simplicity or singleness um, is one understanding. So that we should, we should work with sincerity of heart or singleness of heart. And that's, I think, directed towards Jesus, that singleness of heart, that our heart is, is, is directed towards him. But that can also be translated um, with, with liber, liberality or, or bountifulness um, to be overflowing um, and and again it's that challenge do I do I just do enough or or do I work in a way that that there's there's more left over there's a there's there's it's bountiful it's there's liberality do I only give to my employer what I feel like they're paying me or do I give to my employer far beyond that and that's challenging. I understand. And even there, there's a flip side that I never thought of before until we're actually in the middle of this. Yeah. Is this, you know, slaves, workers in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men. Yeah. So it's the implication is don't just work in a way that pleases your boss. Yeah. Huh? If we're following Christ, there will be times when we work in a way that might really upset our boss. Mm. I expected yeah. you to pay cash <laughs> so that we could avoid right. tax. Yeah. I would expect you to just get on with things and ignore that person. Yeah. There are ways in which we would work as unto mm. the Lord that might get us fired. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because people 
were quite disappointed with how Jesus behaved at times. I, I think there's a few passages I think there that are seem few, to indicate that. A few that include stones and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so again, I think lots for us to chew on and in, for each of us in our own settings uh, for, for us to be thinking about and chewing on. And, and I think for those who, of us who hold responsibility, who have people who work for us or work under our care, I think a good question is, do people get a taste of what it's like to have Jesus as their master when, when they're led by us? And again, that's a tough question to ask, but it, it's an important one to ask. Are people getting a clear picture of what it's like to be under Jesus' yoke, which he said is, is light um, and, and it's not burdensome, uh, it's a joy. Uh, are, are they getting a, a piece of that picture, um, a big piece, when, when they work underneath of our leadership? And I'm, I'm challenged by that one um, a, as well. So yeah, like we said, uh, these verses are, are simple, um, and, yet, and yet they're, they're in your face, um, and, and they're, they're challenging. And Jesus taught in parables while he was on earth, um, and he said he did that because uh, he, he wanted to hide the truth from those uh, who, who weren't ready uh, to hear it and to receive it. Um, and, but then he told his disciples uh, before he left that the time was coming when he would speak plainly. And we, we see him in this passage really speaking plainly. Uh, and, and yeah, there was one other verse that we talked about that kind of, I guess, brings the soberness of, of his words being plain, and it's uh, it's the verse here at the end where where it says, um, "For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done, and there is no partiality." And I think that's the the, the soberness in all of this yeah. is that there there is a reward. Um, there is, like you said earlier, there's consequence for how we live our life, and we often neg we think negatively about that word, but consequence just means there's there's things that follow, and there's either um, judgment, uh, there's either challenging words to hear from Jesus, or or there's words of great joy and and celebration, and and so yeah. Anything anything to add? And I think just in relation to that, the the verse that you picked up on, and in the verse preceding, it does talk about the reward of the inheritance, but but that verse is sort of interspersed between. Paul writing and talking to the workers and then talk, talking to the masters. And um, we could think that it only applies there, but actually it applies to right. all of these relationships, yeah. whether a husband, wife, children, parents, you know, he, she who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, that she, mm. he has done. Um, first command, or not the first, but the only commandment with a promise, honor your father and mother, because it has a promise so that it will go well with you and you yeah. will live long in the land. And there are consequences to all these things. And these three areas, really going back, it's Paul is saying, whatever you do, and, and his, his, look, this is life, isn't it? Mum and dad, husband and wife, parents and children, work situation, but but there may well be other areas of yeah. life. And these days, like we said, you said earlier, you know, there, there's the area of play, um, rest. In those areas as well, it's about doing it in a yeah. way, living in a way where Jesus would say, right on, yeah. I would have done exactly the same. Yeah. You're representing me well. Yeah. Well done. Let me reward you, good and faithful servant. Yeah. That's what we long to hear, but there is yeah. this other side. Yeah. Sobering. It is. Yeah, and so let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Yeah. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And yeah, again, just encourage you uh, as we've been challenged with this passage, what specifically is, is God speaking to you about today? Uh, and what is he asking you to do? Um, and, and to share that uh, with, with people around you. God's, God's word, uh, his uh, rooting us in, in Christ is meant and made 
to overflow into every area of our life. And the reality is uh, we are not quite there yet. Um, we probably all um, see things in this passage, um, and by probably I mean we definitely all see things in this passage that, that we need to grow in. Yeah. Um, and, and God is, is fully able and fully committed uh, to, to bringing uh, the work that he started in us to completion. So we encourage you not to be discouraged and not yes. to lose heart because he is not the type of father uh, that, like this passage says, um, provokes us or exasperates us with unrealistic uh, expectations or or commands but he his his word says that his commands are not burdensome for us and so um, be encouraged and yeah allow God to speak to you uh, through this passage and respond in obedience and experience the reward and the blessing uh, that he has for you in that and also for those around you uh, as his work continues to to spread uh, into those around you be encouraged. Um, Charlie, do you want to pray for us? Yeah. And we'll let them go. I will. Father, I thank you that your word is filled with life. Uh, Lord, I ask that as we receive your word, um, that you will plant it deep in our hearts and cause it to grow and bear fruit uh, to your glory and to our rich benefit and help us wherever we may have felt a rebuke or a challenge, guard us from condemnation, but help us mm. to respond to you and primarily come first and foremost to you, Lord Jesus, our Savior, and be saved. Help us to live in the provision of salvation that you've given and made. Yeah. You paid the price for us. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. We'll see you guys soon. See you soon. And cut. <laughs> you should leave that in there. <laughs>